I'm sure many of you are wondering, and are very, very curious, fungi? Is she crazy? What's going on here? So what I would like to do today is to talk about unlocking the bakery potential in, with the synergy of fermentation, fungi, and fermented fungi. Thanks for the nice introduction. My name is Deb Anderson, and I am a team member at the Protein Brewery. So let's dig a little bit deeper into this fermentation, fungi, and fermented fungi. We all know there's climate change happening. We've been here in Chicago this week, and we've seen a major shift in the temperatures, and we've seen a phenomenon that has not been documented in weather since the beginning. And that is many, many different types of tornadoes. Climate change is happening, it is real. We need to take care of this today. Fermented fungi is one of the pieces of the puzzle that can make an impactful contribution in battling climate change and reducing hunger. The fungi-based ingredients can also contribute towards a transition as we need more protein to feed the people. It is estimated that there will be about 50 billion people by the year of 2050. We need to be able to feed them. We need to be able to feed them with high-quality nutritious products. Fermented fungi brings to the table high-quality protein and essential fatty acids insoluble dietary fiber, vitamins, and minerals. It is a very neutral ingredient and is easily incorporated in many different products, including bakery products, without compromising on taste or texture. That way everyone can win. I'm going to talk a little bit more about protein. Protein is my background, protein is my passion. As we're trying to feed all these, all these people, we need to look at why some consumers are not consuming alternative proteins. Cost is a major factor for this. It's too expensive, I don't know what it's gonna be like, and it's probably likely not gonna meet my expectations. Here within the bakery space, consumers want the best tasting product with the base, best texture and, oh gosh, I guess I should maybe think a little bit about health and nutrition, but I am not gonna compromise on my bakery products. So I'm going to, I want something that we're going to call permissible indulgence. So what are some of these challenges with these other products that are out there? Well, if we're looking against um, meat type or animal-based proteins, we're thinking probably of our eggs and of our milk that's going into our, our products. They have some challenges. They're typically hard to scale, they're expensive, and they have a high carbon footprint. So our next alternative is going to be plants. But plants, we only have a limited amount of land left available to grow additional plants. They also come with some challenges, such as flavor and digestibility, and land use with more water. The fungi-based proteins come into play, and they're extremely scalable. In a, I know a facility that is less than a half a city block that can produce over a thousand metric tons of product. That is a very small carbon footprint for a very large output of a very nutritious product. So is there a synergy between fermentation and fungi? Fermentation, as everyone in this room knows, the most common one that we're looking at is yeast. So it is a, micro, a metabolic process that is going to consume the sugars and the carbohydrates and can convert them into smaller components and things like carbon dioxide, which is gonna help our dough rise and give that nice light texture. It is also known as a food preservative. If you sat in the talk yesterday with Richard, it was, we preserve, we've got wine, we've got beer, cheeses, and breads. It's a food preservation system. Well, the fungi also has a metabolic process. Fungi is known to be the nature's first decomposer. It is consuming things that humans, such as ourselves, cannot consume, like cellulose. So it's gonna consume those trees that have fallen down and convert that into rich soil where we can grow additional plants for feeding the population. It is a microbe. 
There are literally hundreds of thousands of different uh, fungi strains. And when I'm talking about fungi, you may say, is it mushroom, is it fungi, is it mold, what is it? What we're talking about here today is the mycelium roots. So it is not technically a mushroom. A mushroom is the fruiting body. Fungi has a kingdom of its own. I'll, be, I'll admit, when I started with the protein brewery, I had to re re refresh that. We have the animal kingdom, the plant kingdom, and the fungi kingdom. So let's dig a little bit deeper. There are different types of fermentation. We have aerobic and anaerobic. Aerobic fermentation means we have the presence of oxygen. Some examples of that are gonna be the production of beer and wine, vinegars, and part, partly yeast. Yeast is a unique um, item because it's both anaerobic and aerobic. It starts out aerobic and transfers into an anaerobic situation. It's extremely sustainable. As many of you have made sourdough, we can continually pass on some of our cultures. It has a very, very low carbon footprint and it is environmentally friendly. So what are some of these applications? You're wondering, fungi, Ugh, gosh, bakery, mold, Ugh, I don't think I want anything a part of this. So is she crazy? Some of you that know me, that might be true. Or am I on to something here? So we have so that we've identified that we have with fungi in products, they are very high in a complete protein and high in insoluble dietary fiber. As we move into that next generation of bakery items where we want something with a little bit more nutrition, this can be a good alternative to put in there. We have found that these fermented fungi ingredients are inert. So what does that mean and what is that going to do for me in my bakery? Well, in most typical proteins, they are going to bind, gel, emulsify, or foam in your product. You may not want some of those characteristics, so then you're going to be combating. You want more protein or fiber, but you have to combat with some of the characteristics that come with it. The fermentation-derived products are inert. Essentially, they're bringing to the table nutrition without playing with the textures of the products. Now, I do take a disclaimer here. As I mentioned, there are th hundreds of thousands of different mycelium or fungi-based products. So we have many, many different strains. So please check with your supplier um, as to which particular type you have. It can be gluten-free. Now, I realize no, uh, not everyone in this room is concerned about gluten-free, or maybe you don't even want to worry about it within your factory. Not that gluten intolerance is growing, per se, but many families today if we have one member of our family that is gluten intolerant, we buy it for the entire family. And that's why we're starting to see an even bigger trend, upward trend, of gluten-free products being sold, made and sold. Fermented fungi can be very clean in flavor, very bland and neutral. They love water. Particularly, because of the insoluble dietary fiber, they're gonna grab onto that moisture and hold onto it very tightly can absorb upwards of four times their weight in water. We go to bake it off, so we're gonna add about five to 10% more moisture to your formula. Some of it's gonna bake off. You gotta remember, this guy's a, this little fun guy or fun gal is gonna grab onto that moisture and hang onto it for dear life. That moisture is bound. So now we've got more water in our product, but it's bound and it's gonna give the perceived freshness for a longer period of time and a softer, product as well. So what are some of the role, excuse me, the role of fermentation and baking? So these microorganisms, like we talked about earlier, are going to convert the carbohydrates, the sugars and the starches, into the carbon dioxide to get that nice rise within the dough. What I do at home as a baker is not a baker, so please bear with me. What I do and what you do from a professional standpoint, you would cringe. So I did a little bit more research on the baking and on the aroma of breads, and I found a couple different articles stating that there are between 300 and 520 volatile components in the process, in the aroma process of making bread. That's really cool. And a lot of them are coming through the fermentation process. Fermented sourdough is also easier for us to digest, and it comes to brings to the party essential vitamins and minerals, where some of these other white breads do not. They're more refined. 
And fermentation, as we heard yesterday, is also known as one of the greatest inventions of this century. So what are some of the most common microorganisms that we know about in the baking industry that, go, that do fermentation processes? Well, obviously one of them is yeast. That's typically a Saccharomyces uh, species. Now, as we all know, as you pick a different yeast for a different application, you get different textures and aromas. So here we come back again that this is a very complex system. There's also some lactic acid bacteria that join in on the party and bring some of those volatile, volatile aroma components where we get some of that nice um, lactic acid taste, that sourdough taste coming to the party. And now we have a new entrance. We have fermented fungi that is joining the party here in the baked goods. When we bake, we all know, and as I said, you're the experts here, that we have specific temperatures, time, and relative humidity for each and every different product that we make. So we need to have pick the correct tool in the toolbox to do the job that we're looking for. Fermented fungi tends to be a very robust type product. It can, uh, it can survive and thrive under high temperatures, harsh acid conditions, and in many different relative humidity areas. Do the consumers even care about fermentation? Eh, they may know the word, but what they're concerned about is don't mess with my, my bakery products. I want it to taste good. I want it to have a good texture. It, gosh, I really like that artisanal type of product. I just came back from the Netherlands last week, and I'll, I miss already some of the options of bread and things that I can get over there that I don't typically get in my Jewel Osco close by. So what the fermentation is doing is it's bringing that nice artisanal premium quality. It brings back memories. We, we heard about telling stories the other day in the keynote and about memories and things that we want to remember. Who, why do we want to be remembered? Brings back the, the thought and the smell of sitting at grandma's house while she's making bread. So let's harness the power of this fungi. As I mentioned, there are three kingdoms. We have the animal, the plant, and the fungi. Fungi tends to be closer in nutritional composition to the animal proteins. So in this particular slide, we're showing beef, but we can also look at eggs and milk. What I'm showing you here is the green bar is the high quality products, the protein, the fiber, the unsaturated fatty acids. The yellow bar is the sugars, the carbohydrates, and the, and the saturated fatty acids. So as we can see, broadly speaking again, the fungi has a very good nutritional profile. Let's talk a little bit about amino acids and essential amino acids. In this particular industry, we're not as, it's not as common to be looking at protein and protein quality. That is the innovation. That is the future, and that's where we're going to be able to bring more nutrition to our consumers. What we're looking at is an essential amino acid is the amino acids that you cannot, you cannot make in your body, but you need to consume. A complete protein means it contains all those essential amino acids in a specific ratio. The FAO, HWO, and FDA have come together with a methodology called Protein Digestible Corrected Amino Acid Score. That means we can compare proteins across the board in a level playing field. What does this mean to you and why do you care? Let's say you're gonna add, you wanna make a protein bread. That's what your salesperson came back, said, hey, we gotta get one of these, we gotta get it out there on, on the marketplace. So you're looking at different things, you're like, oh, let's just grab this protein, I've heard something about it. Um, it happens to be a pea protein. I'm gonna put 10 grams in there. I want a high protein claim. High protein claim is 10 grams per serving. A good source of protein is five grams per serving. I put 10 grams in. When we do our nutritional facts panel, we can only claim eight grams because the PD cast score is 0.8. The fermented fungi, on the other hand, has a calculated PD cast score of one. We put 10 grams in, we can claim 10 grams on our nutritional facts panel. 
And this just also goes to show some of the other uh, products that are out there with their PDCAS score. So what is the composition of some of these ingredients? They're approximately 45 to 50% protein. They're ranging around 32% insoluble dietary fiber. They have a little bit of fat. Again, it's the good fats. Essential fatty acids, vitamins, and minerals, but very, very low sugars or carbohydrates. So what are some of those fungi-based physical characteristics? And are we crazy to try and put this into baked goods? What we found is that being a complete inert protein, and I've had to talk with a number of you over the course of these past few days, is that my salespeople team, my marketing team, have come and they said we needed to do, start exploring some of these higher nutrition products, keto, gluten-free, or just something with a little bit more nutrition. But I don't want it to be rubbery. If I'm making a brownie, what can I do? We're looking for an inert protein. There are not many proteins out there that I'm aware of that are inert in nature. Inert in the product, not in the body, because they are fully digestible in the body. We have a very high insoluble dietary fiber content. What a beautiful marriage with bakery products. It has a very bland flavor. It has high water binding capacity to help extend that shelf life, that, per that perception of soft, fresh, less staling over time. It comes in a powder format. It's easy to use, it's easy to store. We have a long shelf life. And it's easily incorporated. Because it is a powder, we have no special in handling um, tips. All we need to do is to incorporate it with our other dry ingredients. So let's go back and talk about fungi again. Fungi and fungals are very sustainable. We can, on one hectare of land, we can produce four times more protein, high quality protein, than we can with soybean. Remember, we've only got about 10% um, land available left on our planet that, is, that we can use. It's a very versatile ingredient. It likes to consume all kinds of stuff every, for its uh, food source, its sugar source. So it could be a glucose syrup, it could be potatoes, it could be cassava, it could be sugar beets. It's very versatile. It's also something that we can look at, can we upcycle? At dinner last night, we were talking about food waste. And one of the percentages we heard is that over 40% of our food is wasted. That's a lot. It would be nice if we could recycle that and bring that back. Fungi may be one of those answers to that solution. It's very scalable. Hypothetically, if it didn't cost us an arm and a leg, in the bioreactors for um, bioethanol, different types of fungi strains could grow in those types of uh, processing plants. Everyone is a little bit different. Some of them are very, need sterile equipment, some of them do not. So they're very scalable. And it's also a way to increase food security. We can grow these, fun, these fermented fungi literally all over the world. So locally produced, right next to where your bakery is, to have this product. We're going to help with that food security. So what again are some of those advantages that we have? Again, we talked about high in fiber, a complete protein. For all practical purposes, it's almost carbohydrate free. In this particular case, it is gluten free as well, which leads us to the third one of non-allergenic. As you look at some of these protein sources that you're trying to incorporate into your products, you may want to be looking at, are they allergenic, yes or no? Are, this particular one is not. It is also non-GMO, wild strain, easily used. And loosely call it plant-based because they don't really give us an, um, a category for fungi-based at this time. I have two uh, case studies to share with you. One is a high-protein mark, high-protein bagel that is the first to market with a fungi-based, fermentation-based ingredient. What did they want it for? They wanted it because there's a lack of protein and fibers in some of this, these ingredients. But they also wanted to keep a soft, chewy texture. In this particular case, beta-glucan can be also used as a claim for supports the immune system. Another case study to look at is a gluten-free bread. Again, 
I know not everybody wants to go into the gluten-free space, but it is also, let's admit, it is very difficult. It's not easy to do, or otherwise we would all do it, right? What happens? I am not a, I do not need to consume um, uh, gluten-free products, but I have been trying them, so I can educate myself on what some of the challenges that are out there. And in my limited research, they're very dry, dense, crumbly, and not much flavor. By utilizing a fermented fungi, we can increase that moisture content. Remember, it loves water, and that water is bound. And it gives us that perception of a soft, fresh bread over time. But the biggest thing for the commercial bakers out here is we don't see a change in proofing time or baking time. I was once told that commercial bakers don't like change. We're trying to help out with that. Dr. Lynn, would you like to say a few words? Okay, I do um, consulting work for clients and one of the questions that come up, you know, very frequently is how can I increase the protein content of my product without using soy, dairy, legumes, gluten, right? So when this particular product came onto my radar, I was like, wow, this is just the tip of the iceberg what they have to offer here. And on top of that, you know, um, the sustainability story, the sustainable story. Okay, um, I just want to share with you, as Richard said yesterday, fermentation is the solution to a lot of our future food problems. So this is one of the products that's available to you right now that you can utilize to help you sell the high protein sustainable story, okay? So I use this particular product, about 5% in a bread formula, no, conventional bread, not gluten-free. And yes, it took more water because of fiber, right? So as you can see, the fermented fungi is the lower red line and the control sample is the blue line on top. I'm like, okay, fiber, that's great. Maybe it sucked up more water, maybe made it softer. And then how can it be so soft? Like, a week later, it was really still so soft. Can anybody guess why? That's what I thought. That's what I thought. So I went back to the team and I asked the team, is there any amylase in this thing? <laughs> what is it, Dad? Yes, there is. There is natural amylase in this particular product. That is like cherry on top of the cake, guys. So not only does it increase the moisture, not only does it increase your protein sustainably, it has amylase. Increases the shelf life of your product by making it softer, less crumbling, and springier. So that's what I want to um, talk about today is the functionality of this particular product. Um, with this kind of application there. So, yeah, great. Thank you. Thanks for letting me um, test this product. Thanks, Lynn. So in summary, we're very excited that Lynn jo um, joined the, the party with us and took a look at the ingredient because she's, she is a baker. I'm not, what I do at baking isn't quite qualified. So the product is very neutral in flavor. We add more water. Water is cheap or less costly in our formulations. We can keep a very low water activity in our products, but yet have that perception of soft, fresh product for a longer period of time. We've also noticed that there's an improved machinability. It's not as sticky. Easier to shape, easier to work with. There is no impact on our yeast fermentation. Now, as with every tool in the toolbox, we have to know what the limitations are. We can share those with you. It's working extremely well in the gluten-free space, in the gluten-free area. Talked a little bit about this, but this was a quote that Lynn gave to us um, before we even started talking about this, this um, presentation. 
And again, that goes to feeding the world by 2050. We have a lot of people to feed. We can help with the baking, with our baked goods, making it just a little bit more nutritious without compromising on that flavor or that texture. So with this, will you join us in innovation for the future? I've got a microphone. Oh, no. <laughs> um, just a couple questions. Sorry if that's too loud. Um, my first question is, have you tried this in um, intense processes such as prime? Like yes. Yes, we put it uh, with donuts. Okay, fantastic. Do you tried see donuts. increased shelf life with that typically? Or? I'm sorry, second question. Does it help with the shelf life with that, essentially? We're on limited trials with that. We have um, uh, one person in application, so we're, we're working through things. But what we're finding, because it's much more water-loving, is that it's not sucking up the oil. Okay. Um, so that's what, one of the things that we're seeing. Uh, we have done, I know it's probably not in this area, but we've made uh, tortilla chips with it, and very crispy and uh, nice and light. My second question is, uh, is there a negative effect on dough rheology at all? I know sometimes enzymatic activity can create a lot of that, so. Go ahead. No, I don't believe so. I did not see any, uh, I did not. I did not see <laughs> any changes in the rheology when I was using it in the mixing and baking tests. So it's not like, um, you know, uh, extra vital B gluten, you know, it doesn't affect um, the machinability that way. Thank you. There are limits, though, and, and we've taken the guesswork out of many of those, so we can give you those uh, the bandwidth on where you should to start and where to go. That's a question. Uh, how does the ingredient? Jesus, how does the ingredient show up on the label, product label? Uh, there is a product that's commercially available right now, and they're putting it on the label: fermented plant protein. Uh, we are self-affirmed grass, so this particular ingredient, working on our grass dossier, and we have about 10 or 12 suggested labels, labeling terms to put on pack. Are there other questions? We will be around uh, later today, and happy to answer any, any questions. Sweet. Well, thank you, Deb and Lynn. Thank you. I also have some loaves of bread to get them <laughs> for speaking. So, Dad, thank you. Thank you. Now I am a baker. <laughs> <laughs> and Dr. Lynn Person. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.